Thank you for joining us at Four Anglers, the digital network that keeps fishing alive. And uh, this week we have uh, on the line technical with Yanni Steitler again, and he's bringing us the next issue of getting technical on reels. Uh, Yanni, welcome with us uh, this evening. Yes, thanks, uh, Werner, and welcome to the viewers. Uh, once again, thanks for what you're doing for the fishing industry, keeping the, the interest levels up and giving us something to look forward to. So, yeah. So, like Anna said today, we're going to be discussing the bait, bait feeder reels. So, I think, uh, Anna, if you want to get going with some questions. Well, Yanni, last time we touched on uh, the different types of reels and uh, where we use them and how we use them. Now we're going to get into a little bit more technical issues, specifically the bait feeder reels and how they work. When am I on this on the front rack? When I, am I on the rear drag? So just take us through that process, please. Yeah, so if you remember last time we discussed the, the features of the bait feeder reel, which has the dual drag, so you can feed line to the fish when it hooks itself and it runs off and moves off with the bait. You can give line without having your rod pulled off the stand, and that's a big, big catch in, in banking. So to explain how the mechanism works, um, I'm going to show you how the bait runner mechanism works inside the reel and how it engages and disengages the first of all the the shaft which is essentially what we're talking about here because the shaft is what determines whether it's fixed in which case your front drag is working or when the shaft is loose and then your rear drag is working or that's your bait feeder function so i'm going to go forward here and just show you all the bait, bait feeder reels let's start with this one have this mechanism at the back and that's to engage disengage now so there's no clear-cut rule as to whether it's up is engaged and down is disengaged, it varies from reel to reel. So you just need to figure that out for yourself and see how that works. The reason for that is there's different ways that the mechanism work, works inside the reel and that has space restrictions. So the guys come up with different mechanisms inside there to do it. They're not all the same. So what is important out of that is when you buy reels, try and buy the same reel so that for instance, all your reels down is engaged and up is disengaged, so you don't get confused. I've taken a reel apart here. I'm going to try and show you how the mechanism works. So there's two stages to the mechanism. The first one is the disengaging of the shaft, and that happens at the back here. And there's a little lever there, and it shifts a plate up and down here, which engages or disengages your shaft. So I'm just going to show you here. Let's just see. Can you see that? Yes, that looks good. So what you have is down here, if you watch this little plate down here, there's a steel plate there, and that moves up and down as this mechanism here engages and disengages. So I'm trying to keep this as still as possible. What's happening there is it's lifting that lever here. There's a little lever that goes down that lifts that plate up and down and that engages and disengages the shaft. So you can see now it's lifted that plate up and the shaft is disengaged. Oh, and while we're busy here, I'll just show you now where most of the rear drag. Hmm? Now, now this is the rear drag. This is your, your bait feeder drag. Okay, and I'm going to try and show you here a little steel plate there and that's what creates the, the clicker effect. I don't know if you can see it there. Yes, yes we can see that. That's the clicking noise and you can probably hear it. Now because it's just a, a feather spring these do tend to break over time or they can after a couple of years or lots of use they can be they can break and it's a inexpensive part to replace and we, we carry a lot of stock with spares of those um, because it is one of the, the parts that it does have wear and tear on it. So that's the disengaging of the shaft. And now I'm going to try and show you how the shaft re-engages. If you look here, you'll see there's a lever there that goes onto the top of the main gear. And you'll see on the top of the main gear, there's two gears there. So there's a circle, an inner circle, and on the outside of that inner circle, there's two gears. Those are literally little bump places where it re-engages this lever, okay, and it pushes it away and it re-engages the lock on the shaft, okay, so that your your shaft is locked up again and only your front drag comes into play. So what happens, it's a bit difficult to show here, but as you turn, as you wind here, and now bear in mind this lever is not in the place that it should be, okay, so there's the disengaged position, you can see this lever is back, okay, 
and the shaft is locked. I can't turn it. When I engage, I'm moving it up. Okay, you can see that this lever has now moved forward and is now in a position where when I wind, you can see there it gets to that point and it's now on one of those nodes and what it does is it pushes it back, okay, okay. and it disengages the whole mechanism. So it's, it's a little bit difficult to, to show clearly, but that's basically how the bait runner mechanism works. So it's a mechanical trip inside there and it's dependent on, first of all, you winding or mechanically moving the, the lever. Both of those will engage when you wind, what I'm showing you now will engage, or dropping the lever will engage or disengage. Okay, Yanni, so just to get to the practical sense of it. So I've got a bait, bait feeder reel for the first time ever now. So now I get ready to cast. So I make sure that the, that the, the lever is, is engaged so that I'm on my front drag. I tighten my front drag. I then cast, when I put it down, I get my line tension and everything ready. And then I put the lever, I disengage the, the shaft so that it is now on the bait runner. Now I have to test or check it so that I am happy with that. And I'm happy with the fighting drag in terms of the tightness. And then I leave it on the, on the well in this case, on the rear position, is that correct? That's correct, yeah. And in all likelihood, you wouldn't even have to check it when you're about to cast because you would have wound it in. And there's no reason why you would have engaged the, the bait feeder. So that bait feeder is something you'll only engage when, once it's on the rod stand and, and sort of ready to go. And it's always a good idea to test it. You know, I've, I'm quite forgetful, so I always test it just to make sure because you don't want to have your rod pulled in or, or lose a fish because you forgot to engage it. There's other tricks you can do as well. You could put some orange paint in the position on the on the real frame where you could, if you see the orange paint, you know it's engaged. You know, something like that. So there's there's ways of getting around it, but it's always good just to, to check it. Okay, so now I put it back. I've got my policeman on. It is ready. I get a bite, a bite and the reel is running. So now I, I pick it up. What is important in terms of, firstly, if the the bait feeder system is too loose what what can happen that's the first question and secondly what is the best for me to do do i start reeling immediately do i um, just pick it up with my finger on the spool or do i flick the switch and then what is the best for the reel so there's there's a number of factors that come into play there let's start with the tension on the, the bait feeder you know if your bait feeder is, is too loose you've got a chance that you might not hook the fish, okay? So you need a bit of tension for the fish. When he, when he takes a line, you want to give line, but you also want to, even if it's just the point of the hook goes in there, you want to have that little bit of security that the, the fish is now hooked. So from there, it it's also depends on conditions. If you have a heavy crosswind or you have a current that's going and it's taking a bit of line, you don't want that release, then you don't want to create any slack in your line and have a bow effect. So you want enough tension there that environmental factors aren't going to pull the line off the reel. You don't want it too tight that the fish panics too much. So you want them to move off and gradually set the hook. So too tight can have two disadvantages. It can also pull the, the rod off the stand if it's too tight, or it can break the line if you're fishing with light line. So you need to find that balance. Um, it's usually on the looser side as opposed to the tighter side. You then asked what happens when you hook a fish. Well, that would depend on what you've done with your front drag. Did you loosen your front drag when you put the, the rod on the stand? Or is your, dra your drag still locked up from when you cast it? And that's one of the things that the bank anglers like to do is they like to use a backwind feature on the reel. But typically what would happen is once you put that reel onto the stand, you'd, you'd re-engage the anti-reverse so that it can't spool off, you know. So typically what would happen, you get a good run, the fish is moving off. Okay, your policeman goes tight, the drag starts, pick that up and engage. Either engage manually with your lifting the lever or give it a turn and it's going to engage. Give it a strike because let's say you're fishing out there at 100 meters and you're using five pound line, it's got a lot of stretch in it. So the first thing is you need to set the hook, make sure the fish is on. And then there's two things you can do. Either you can disengage the anti-reverse, in which case you can start backwinding, or what a lot of guys do is simply just go on to the back bait runner feature and let the fish take line and you can control that tension with your, your finger if you want to. When the fish stops running, because normally that first run is also the, the strongest longest and longest run. So after that, then you've got better control over the fish and then you can start bringing him in and you can start playing him on the, the back one, using the back one. So it's 100% to um, to just pick it up and then when I'm ready, start reeling and then the, the mechanism of the reel um, will then um, engage the break again. Yes, 
And the other thing is, you know, sometimes you're going to end up with the fish, you get that back bite where he comes in towards you, you get the slack, your policeman lands in the water, so you need to take up that slack, feel it, feel it, and then when you see that tension, the guards strike it, so you need to get onto that fish. So that would depend, it comes down to a lot of personal choice there, but there's a lot of different options because of the feature of the, the bait feeder on the reel as to how you're going to handle it. Okay, let's let's move on to the to the next question there. In terms of the oscillation, or that is the, the mechanism that moves the... Um, uh, the spool back and forth so that I get a specific line lay. Yeah, so so basically there's two types of oscillation systems on the reels. The one is a geared oscillation where you have a oscillating gear which runs off your main gear and then you have a worm gear system. Now the one isn't better than the other. They have different applications. So a oscillating gear, if I can show you roughly here on the reel, you'll see we have a main gear there. Okay, and under that main gear, and there you can see so this is your main gear which acts on the pinion gear and then underneath that's the oscillating gear. Now this uh, gear happens to come off from a Cairo spinning wheel so that's a you know eight to ten thousand rand reel so it uses the oscillating gear so there's no downside on oscillating gear they're just as good as worm gears and can be better in some situations. What you have is that oscillating gear which is the bigger gear down there underneath the main gear and I'm just going to move the shaft forward here and just turn it down so I can stabilize it. You'll see as I move it backward and forward the handle is turning. You can see that gear underneath there moves forward. That's at the top of your oscillation and backwards and that's at the bottom of your oscillation. So a very good system but the limitation of it is the size of that gear determines how far your spool can move up and down, your shaft can move up and down. Now that's fine for, for most reels. And here I'm going to show you a spool of longbow. And then I'll show you a spool of a LS6K reel. And you can see, for comparison, the LS6K reel has a much deeper spool, a lot more line capacity. And that effect you can achieve with a worm gear because a worm gear, and this here is a, a worm gear. Let me give it some background there. Yeah. Okay, you can, you can see those little gears and um, grooves inside there. What happens with the worm gear is you have a little cup-shaped mechanism that goes in there. And as, as you turn the reel, this is moving up and down in that groove. It moves all the way up, gets to the top, and then the threading reverses, and it now starts heading down. It goes all the way down. So as this turns, your worm gear is static, and your oscillating mechanism moves up and down. Now, you could have this worm shaft could be a meter long. You'd have the oscillation of a meter up and down. So that allows one to have these much deeper spools. And I'll just show you another reel here. You can see the depth of this. If you were to achieve this depth, that would have to be the size of that gear inside the reel. And it's just not practical because the mechanism that's working inside there, this reel, for instance, has a 23 millimeter oscillation. Okay. And that's the depth of the spool there. And that's also the size of the gear inside there. Okay. Okay. So that, that means if you, if you yeah. have that, that long... That long um, spool that needs to travel a lot, you will have a big body of the... Um... Precisely. So this reel here is a 8K, and this is a 45 millimeter spool. So I would need a gear yeah. this big inside that reel. Yeah, not practical. And where am I going to put it? It's not going to work. So that's where a worm gear comes into play. I said there's, there's not a a lot of differences between them but one of the things that happens with the worm gear is it tends to wear a little bit especially at the top or bottom of the oscillation where it turns around so you can have wear either on the worm gear itself or in that little cupping mechanism which just means to it turns around there and you get that that wear on the worm gear because it's pushing the shaft and the spool up and down so it's pushing quite a bit of weight and over time you know, thousands of wines you do get a bit of weight. The advantage you have with a, an oscillating gear is that gear is held in place there. It's meshing to the other gear that drives it from the main main gear. And they're always meshing, so you don't get wear on those gears. They're very reliable and it gives you a, a good line length. The limitation obviously is the depth of the spool there. But but Yanni, is it um, how difficult is it to change that worm gear if I get to a stage after a couple of years and uh, so I guess what will happen is if that starts wearing, um, the spool might go up and then it refuses to come down unless you push it and it meshes again and it comes down. But how difficult it yes, is, it is. is it to, to change the worm gear and uh, how expensive is that? No, it's, it's, it's not difficult and it's relatively inexpensive. You know, it's, a, you know, it's probably going to be under 20 bucks in parts. So it's not expensive. 
that's relatively easy to do. You need to open up the reel or even better, send it to your local tackle dealer. If they can't do it themselves, they'll send it to us and then we can do it. Okay, so, so it's just you know, like, it's a consumable like brake pads on a car. It happens after some time. Exactly. And it's just, it's, it's one of the, the downsides of that type of mechanism. But uh, again, you're going to get years of life out of the reel. And uh, it's not to say that it's, it's going to pay them off for a couple of years. And I, you, you and I both know at the rate which new models come out, you're probably going to have replaced that reel with something better, the latest and greatest, you know? It's so, like some guys, some, some guys on cars, eh? they, um, they, don't, they don't ever replace braking pads because they change the car before the braking pads are done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so one of the things I mentioned was the, this longer length that you have with the um, worm gear. But it has another advantage as well, and that's that you can determine um, or you can slow down your oscillation to get a line lay where it packs closer to each other. Oh. Whereas with a, um, an oscillating gear, that gear is fixed. So your line is going to space evenly down and evenly up. So a half a turn on your real handles will move down, and the other half is going to move it up. You cannot slow that down so that one turn of your handle gives you four, yeah. you know, that your, your rotor turns four times and slows that lay down. So there you have a, 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 basically a one-to-one -one ratio. When it comes to the worm gear, you, they can play with the pitch of these grooves and yeah. they can slow it down. So effectively what you can have, and I'll show this reel here as I turn it. You can see it's a good number of turns and I'll, I'll actually count them. Let me get it to the bottom there. Okay, so there we're basically at the bottom. And as I turn now, we'll get one, two, three. So just under three turns takes you up, okay? So you're gonna have close to five and a half turns for a full oscillation up and down. Whereas on a, a um, oscillating gear, one turn, will give you an up and a down. Oh, okay. okay. So what this allows is, first of all, you've got more depth. So as you have more depth, you can fit more coils on there. So effectively what's going to happen, if you can slow the oscillation down and put the line layers closer to each other, for every layer you have there, the line reduces less. So you can pack more line in there. It's coming off next to each other. I don't know if that's making sense. Yeah, but so if you think of different layers, you know, every time you add a layer, as you remove those layers, you start exposing more of the spool and that's friction on the front end of the spool. So the more you can layer that line that, let's say I've got six coils on there as it comes off and then it reduces by one as opposed to one coming off and then reducing by one so that your spool shrinks quicker. Now you've got a longer spool where you can pack more line and as... So if you're casting far, the amount of line that's going to reduce on your spool and be exposed to the lip in the front, so as you reduce, you start getting friction on the lip of the spool here. That reduces. Mm. So that's the advantage of packing line. Yeah. In, in, layman's, in layman's terms, then uh, you can just cast further without a problem with a long cast spool. That's why it's a long cast. Yeah, and that's why they call them a long cast spool. Exactly. Yeah. So it does have advantages. I don't know how to quantify it in terms of percentages of casting, but it, anything that helps in competitive angle, you yourself know, you know, if the fish are out there at 140, if you can get to 145, you're going to catch a couple more. Yeah. But, but also on these um, longer, long cast spools, it's also a longer gear and it comes out further. I, isn't there a bit of a problem with it when you cast or when you apply pressure that it's longer out? So what, what must I do as an angler? So yeah, one of the things to watch out for on a, a long cast spool, is as you extend this, it's, there's this, the spool is on maximum there, so you've got quite a long way. Let's assume a couple of things here. When you're going to cast now, your line is at the top there, okay? So what you have is unsupported from here all the way up to there. Yeah. When you cast, that's probably the most pressure that you put on a reel. You're never going to put that kind of pressure on a, on a reel when you're fighting a fish. So what you need to be careful of is if the line's right up here, I can exercise quite a lot of stress on that shark. And there is a small chance under the right conditions that you could end up bending the shaft slightly. Okay, so to avoid that, it's better to try and, uh, actually there we are at the max, now you can see, I wasn't at max, but you can see there's a big extension there. Now they try and mitigate it a bit by trying to support the spool as far as possible. Yeah. You can see the, the rotor and the all the way up there. But try and avoid casting with the line right up at the top there, just because of that action of the... So it's better, it's better to cast with, with my spool right in? Yeah, right in or halfway down. You know, yeah. You'll also see one of the features of these reels that have uh, worm gear oscillations is you often 
get these extensions and you'll see the, the back, back end of the reel is a lot longer there's another yeah. example so it has this abnormal looking body and sometimes you even have a little sort of pp that sticks out there and what that's for is to allow the shaft that shaft has to go somewhere when the reel goes forward and sort of come back so the longer you have that oscillation the more room you need at the back for the shaft to move in and out of. and that's why you get these funny looking reels but the the um uh, worm gear also reduces the overall weight of the um, uh, of the reel because of this. It's it's just much less than what an oscillation gear would be. Mm, not not necessarily. Eh? Most of your, your oscillation gears are not that because they're not that big. Okay, because they're limited by yeah. the size. They're not that heavy, and they're normally they're made out of a zinc alloy or aluminium oh, alloy. Okay. Not that heavy. Whereas your worm gear is made out of stainless steel and it's a solid bar mm. so there's a lot of material in here and it's actually a bit heavier than a, an oscillating gear in most cases so i wouldn't say there's a bit of weight saving in any sense there. but the body it's but just, the body can be slimmer yes the body can be slimmer and, and sometimes you'll see a little bubble in the body as well with the worm gear because it's offset or drive because if your shaft is up here so some reels have a little channel where the, the worm gear sits so to to cap it all off you know the a long cast style um, reel where the line lays a lot closer and you've got more depth, let's say length in that uh, in the spool where you can lay the line down, would typically have a worm gear. Most of your normal reels um, where they have a, a spool depth of under 25 millimeters would work on an oscillating gear mechanism. Okay, so, so if, 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 I, if I see a, a long cast spool, I know it's got a worm gear. More than likely it could have a worm gear. And you know, nowadays you can just have a look on the side of the reel box and it'll tell you whether it's got a worm gear or not. So that that always be specified. Uh, a normal oscillating gear would not be specified, but if it had a, if a reel had a worm gear, that would be specified. Okay, so uh, yeah, so the so wor the worm gear is the exception to the rule. It, uh, yes, it is, and typically you find it on because it's a more expensive mechanism. It might be on a more expensive reel as well. You know, but there's like I said with the Kuma Makara reel, it's an expensive reel and it has an oscillating gear. It doesn't have a worm gear, mm -hmm. so. You know, there's always exceptions. I just wanted to point out one more thing here. And that's now while we were talking about the long cast spool. You'll notice on a lot of spools. So you can see there on the on the front lip of the spool, there's a little 45 degree chamfer. Okay. And what that does is, especially for the bank angling guys, they like to lay a lot of line onto the reel. Okay. So what it does is it gives a little bit of clearance there as your line's coming off. It's not as, as likely to start rubbing against that. It's still going to touch that front lip, but your contact area is now less. You can spool your line up there. I'm just having a look at this and I can see on this reel, slightly packing the line towards the front. Okay. okay which is not a bad thing. But it's, it's one of the things that we can maybe discuss because some, some guys might prefer to manipulate their line lay. You know, a lot of guys like to have their line even. In some situations, you might want your line packed towards the front and very seldom would you want to pack towards the back like this one showing. And what you have inside the reels, where your spool rests, if you can see this, I'm just gonna try and separate these. Couple of shim washers in there. Okay. And these can be removed or added. And what it does is it determines the, the packing of the line. So as your oscillation moves up and down, remember your rotor is static. So that position there stays the same. Now your spool is moving up and down. So you can determine your line packing if you add more of these shim washers. Okay. It's going to pack towards the back. If you remove one of them, it's going to pack to the front. You can also set them up. The reels should come set up that it packs the line level. But if you ever wanted to play around with it, that's how you would go about it. Okay, so, so, so if, if something, if you, if you um, realize you've, um, you've cleaned your, your um, reels or something like that, and suddenly you realize, oops, the line lay isn't the same that it was, there is a possibility that one of those shim washers could have fallen out or thing, something like that. Yeah, and if you're like me, I spend a lot of time on my hands and knees when I clean my reels. Eh? There's always uh, one or two little parts that end up under the couch or something. So, uh, yeah, you know, one, one of the things when it comes to servicing a reel or disassembling it is use your phone and take pictures as you go along. It helps a lot. You think you're going to remember it, but two hours later when you 
start reassembling. Chances are you can start missing parts here and there. So there's a nice tip if you're going to be servicing your reels. Okay. Those uh, shim washers, washers, are they also available aftermarket? Yeah, some of the reels, um, I'm talking out of turn now, but some of them do come with, with spare shim washers in a box. So keep your box and just have a look. There should be a couple of little clear um, shim washers in there. And that's their purpose, you know, so that you can fine tune or adjust as you need. Okay. Yanni, thank you very much. And thank you for um, talking technical to us again. Yes, you would you like to add something more? Yeah, I just wanted to mention the... You know, you'll start seeing some of the drags nowadays have these fast progressive drags where you have a faster pitch on there. And that's when you want to change spools, which the bank angling guys like to do if they break off, just put on a new spool. The, the fast drag gives you a couple of turns and it's tight, a couple of turns and it's loose so you can remove the spool. And some guys might ask why do the, for instance, the Kuma reels not have a quick release spool? because the mechanism is patented by Shimano and that results in, you know, no one can copy that. So that's why a lot of the reels that you see out there don't have the quick clip off spool in the front, but it gives you the advantage of having a front drag, which is a lot smoother. So your main fighting drag will always be a lot smoother than a rear drag mechanism. So that's the advantage of that progressive drag. You can get it all quickly and change, do your spool change. And you can literally do that as you walk back you know, if you've just broken off, it takes a couple of seconds. It's not a major issue, in my opinion. Okay. Okay. Yanni, uh, thank you very much um, for talking technical to us. Uh, we will continue next week with another edition of uh, Talking Technical to Yanni. Uh, to the viewers out there, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, we will see you again tomorrow night with another episode of On the Line With. And uh, for Anglers, the digital uh, platform that keeps fishing alive, we'll talk to you again. So enjoy the night and see you again. You are awesome. Goodbye.